emotionalism and our intellectualism. The 1930s were the years of the Great Depression. A somber mood prevailed in the country, resulting in increasing awareness of its spiritual resources, of which music was one of the most rewarding. And if you take a moment to think about our current situation, history is repeating itself. Also, too, history of repeating itself, a strong current of populism emerged as the decade unfolded, and we're seeing that now in 2010. Then, the government undertook patronage of the arts through the WPA and the Federal Theater Project. This also was the period of the proletarian novel. In fact, if I have fans of cable TV, it's been on uh, Junior Classic Movies not too long ago. Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath is, is an excellent, excellent example. Um, folk and popular music was evident in the music of Virgil Thompson, uh, his piece The River, Aaron Copeland, Billy and the Kid from 1938, Gershwin's Borgian Bess of 1935, Roy Harris's Folk Song Symphony, 1939. At this time, too, the larger radio networks, NBC and Columbia, adopted the policy of commissioning new works. Most important, though, a new public emerged that was interested in hearing and supporting American music. Composers began to write film music, ballets, music for high school students, music for civic celebrations, um, all of these that narrowed the gulf that had separated them from their public. By the end of the 1930s, the American composer was fairly well established as a working artist within the frame of his own country. During more than 50 years of composing, Lucas Foss has embraced everything from American Americana to postmodernist eclecticism. The sheer range of his talents has resulted in a curiously diffuse, unfocused career which never attained the high profile superstar status that one might have expected. Actually, until now, uh, Foss died in uh, July 2009. The British musicologist Wilfred Mellors once described Foss's body of work as, quote, a pocket history of American music during the 20th century, close quote. Foss was aware that his detractors regarded his style hopping as a sign of a dabbler, and that the critics complained that he tended to follow stylistic trends rather than to originate them. In other words, if he was kind of a particular musical will of the wisp, uh, he rejected <coughs> those criticisms and took actually particular pride in the fact that even the listeners who followed his music closely never knew what to expect from him. In fact, his own quote, I would agree that my curiosity has led me absolutely everywhere. This is what Foss told uh, the New York Times in 1979 and continuing. But I make one qualification. I've never done anything at the OK time. In other words, I've never been a bandwagon jumper. I've never belonged to any school. I've never written a 12-tone piece when it was fashionable to do so. That's part of the reason I like Paul so much. He was a rebel of the highest order. And I confess to having a soft spot for rebels. As a result, uh, critics long ago despaired of categorizing Foss. Spin doctors would describe him today probably as, quote, the whole package. Conductor, composer, pianist, and pedagogue. Foss's quote, that you're part of it on the screen here. I conduct because I love to make love to the past. This is what Foss said in the 1975 interview with the New York Arts Journal. Continuing that quote, I think man has this need, and the need to discover the future as well. 
the more my own composition is busy with exploration and experimentation, the greater is my need to keep my tie with the past, which made me a musician in the first place. My life with Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, and Wagner, and Verdi, and Handel, and Schubert. So Foss, recognizing the past, but looking to the future at the same time. Foss himself is part of this new breed of composers that emigrated. He came to the U.S. with his family in 1937, next and continued his musical studies by attending Curtis Institute. There, he studied composition with Rosario's Galera, conducting with Fritz Reiner, um, and others. Incredibly gifted, Foss began to compose at age seven. Prior to attending Curtis, he studied piano and music theory in Berlin with Julius Goldstein. He studied composition with Paul Hindemith as a special student at Yale, and at the age of 23, he was the youngest composer to win a Guggenheim Fellowship. The year before, at a youthful 22, Foss's identification with his new homeland found expression and won him great acclaim for the cantata, The Prairie, based upon Carl Sandburg's poem. The Prairie emanates from Sandburg's book, Cornhusker which was published just at the end of World War I, 1918. Foss's use of Sandberg's text takes its cue from the times. It incorporates the positive imagery of the poetry and serves as a reaction of American consciousness to industrialization and the environment. After its premiere, under the direction of Robert Shaw, uh, it's actually at the height of World War II, 1944, Foss's work received the New York Music Critics Circle Award for Best New American Work. The American strain co-mingled in his style with the romantic heritage of Mahler, the neoclassicism emanating from Hindemith, and the inescapable influence of Stravinsky makes this such a wonderful, wonderful work for us. Now, historically, we like to divide Foss's works up into three periods. This cantata is a first period work, and we divvy those up uh, ballpark 1944 to about 1960 is Foss's first period. In this work, he's predominantly neoclassical and eclectic in nature with that element of American populism. Foss's works exhibit a distinct personality. He's enthusiastic, he's curious, he's witty, he's receptive to new musical ideas. More important, through his musical works, Foss instills the same inquisitive spirit in his audiences that Sandberg inspired in his readers. Like Foss, Sandberg was virtually unknown as a writer when, in 1914, a group of his poems appeared in Poetry Magazine. At the age of 40, Sandberg published another volume of poems in 1918, Cornhuskers. His experiences working and traveling greatly influenced his writing and his political views. Carl Sandberg worked from the time he was a young boy. He quit school following graduation from eighth grade, and in eight, that was 18 <coughs> and spent several years working a, a variety of jobs delivered milk. He harvested ice. Uh, he shined shoes. I don't think he waited tables, but we'll have to double check. It's possible. We'll have to double check on that one. Uh, but one of the things he did do, he traveled as a hobo in 1897. It was that phase of Sandberg's life during which he learned a number of folk songs that he later performed at speaking engagements. In fact, he collected folk songs. I suppose that makes him technically a music